change is a seed buried somewhere beneath our passion and our purpose. It takes root in our spirit, sprouting throughout our veins, pumping through every heartbeat. God is doing a new thing at Mesa Church, and we are ready to make his vision for us a reality. As our church continues to grow in the culture of generosity, we are simultaneously launching ourselves into the next chapter of ministry God has for us. We understand the value and mission of the local church, and we stand ready to embrace this now opportunity. Our response is the NOW initiative, a two-year-long journey that we will make together. This will require us to individually and collectively seek and depend on the Lord like never before. Each of us will need to examine what sacrifices we can make and bring those sacrifices before the Lord as one body. We are called to make an impact, and the time is now. Well, good morning, everyone. I had the thought this morning as I woke up, the Seahawks are playing at 9.30. 6.30, actually. Maybe I should just skip church. <laughs> you ever have that thought? Just curious. It's an honest question. <laughs> if we could only be like Pastor Sharon. Uh, truth is, uh, about six months ago, we were doing a canvassing project. We were in the neighborhoods, and there was another young adult with me, and we were going around doing the door hangers because three times a year, we invite our community to special services in the church. We believe that Jesus is not to be hoarded. Amen? Amen. I mean, seriously, like that's, that is the reason we invite people to church because of what Doug shared. Like there is such a value of being a part of the body of Christ. Like I just, it like blows my mind that we think that, that church would not be something that meets people's deepest needs. Now, I'm not saying church is perfect. Far from it. We're going to talk about that today. But he, he did say to me, he goes, do you ever just, you know, just consider, like, you know, because I almost didn't go to church this morning. Do you ever consider, uh, you know, just not going to church? And, uh, and, I, and I looked at him and I said, yes, a lot. <laughs> now, that was in the season of setting up and tearing down. And, man, we've come a long ways. I'm grateful for, you know, just where we are and uh, the response to the NOW initiative, which is what you've seen, and just what God has done. Look around, look around. And it's been awesome, you know, God has provided a place for us, and there's just so much that God has done, I'm grateful. Uh, truth is, I come to church not because I have a job to do, but because I'm committed. Turn to your neighbor and say committed. committed. Many of us have made our games life, and we've turned life into games, haven't we? I was reading a, a, an article, um, and I actually posted this in notes, you can look it up called Cheap Sex and the Decline of Marriage. Um, and I know that there's probably not small children in the room. But there was a quote that really caught my attention in that article, and it came from a young adult that was interviewed for it named Kevin, who is a 24-year-old recent grad from Denver who wanted to get married someday and is almost 100% positive that he will, but not soon, he says, because I am not done being stupid yet. I still want to go out and have sex with a million girls. He believes that he's figured out how to do that. Here's his strategy. Girls are easy to, easier to mislead than guys just by lying or just not really caring. If you know what girls want, then you know uh, you should not give that to them until the proper time. If you do that strategically, then you can really have anything you want, whether it's a relationship, sex, or whatever. You have control. Turn to your neighbor and say, sociopath. That's a real quote, that's a real way of thinking, and if you didn't realize that, that is out there in the world. I have two daughters and I own guns. <laughs> and sometimes the desert that we find ourselves in is a self-created desert, isn't it? It's the choices and the culmination of those choices that create that create a culture that is either life-giving or life-taking. And we are constantly in the middle of cultures, aren't we? Church culture, business culture, marriage culture, neighborhood culture, 
societal culture, Costa Mesa culture, Huntington Beach culture, Irvine culture, Hispanic culture, Caucasian culture, African American culture, a lot of cultures that converge. And what is it that we are hoping to do, even in this church culture, is build kingdom culture. Hopefully, the kind of kingdom culture that will foster life. And everyone wants community, but few people are willing to pay the cost of cultivating the kind of community that humanity truly craves, that we crave. Why? Because a life-giving kingdom culture community comes at a high price. Do we contribute more than we take? That kind of culture begins with a sacrificial commitment to something bigger than each of us so that we can actually reap what we sow. I actually heard Doug talk about that in his video. If you want to reap relationship and commitment and connection and all of the things that we desire, you've got to invest something somewhere along the way so that when you get to a catastrophe in your life, there's actually something to give back. I can't encourage you enough uh, to be a part of small groups, get on a serve team, build relationships with people. So how can we build a community that will give life, not take it? Well, first of all, don't be Kevin, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be Kevin. <laughs> All right, Kevin is a user. Here's the scary thing. A lot of us think about church the same way Kevin thinks about girls. It's all about us. What can I get? When can it meet my needs? What can I do to make sure that I am taken care of? And when a lot of people have that same kind of consumer mentality about the community we're all trying to build, it can be a very destructive community. It can be a very demoralizing experience for people who feel like they end up getting used, and that's not life-giving. I want to read a, just a quick verse, but I'm going to tell you the story of it, and it's found in the Old Testament. Once upon a time, there was a girl, and this girl grew up with all of the hopes and aspirations of <clears throat> being a mom and 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 and. Uh, and, and being a part of uh, what, what, what God could do in her nation. You see, her nation was a blessed nation. They had quite a story of relying on Yahweh and trusting God to move them from a bad place to a better place, right? Their history involved being slaves in a nation called Egypt, and they, uh, they followed God's call to, uh, to, into the desert by following this guy named Moses, who was 80 years old, and for the next 40 years old, Moses led them, and he led them uh, or, or to the promised land, but their, their people didn't have the faith that it required to, to actually get in. There was no trust in God, even after all the miracles they had seen. So they wandered in the desert, and a generation passed away, and a, a generational leader by the name of Joshua rose up, and they entered into the promised land. And for the next a uh, few years, it was kind of like a anything goes environment, kind of like the wild, wild west. <laughs> Some people would say this was the time where, you know, there was tribes and tribalism and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, okay? This was the environment that Naomi grew up in. And <clears throat> she knew that part of, uh, part of fulfilling God's call in her life was to get married, but she also knew that there was a practical nature to it in that in ancient times, the way, part, of, part of the way that God would provide for women was that they would get married. Now, today's world is very different, isn't it? God can provide a woman for a woman and they never have to get married. They can be a professional and they can do all sorts of things. And to be honest, that is God's intention, that two people would partner together. But the reality is that God can do more when people partner together. That's why we're all sitting here. And a marriage is just a smaller version of this larger version that we're experiencing today. And so she, you know, maybe fell in love. We don't know the backstory. But Naomi ended up marrying a man named Elimelech. And Elimelech <clears throat> grew up in the time of the age, uh, judges, and there was a famine in the land. And so instead of hunkering down and relying on the community and trusting God, he decided to go where the grass was greener. How many of you in the last three years have thought, I wonder if the grass is greener outside of the borders of California? <laughs> Said no Californian, right? <laughs> I mean, it's been something that all of us have thought about at some point. I mean, I think just in all honesty. 
And yet, if you're still here, there's something that is either holding you back from moving because God's called you to be here. He's called you to be the light. He's called you to be a part of what God is doing in California. And so goes California. So goes the nation. You better believe that you're on the front lines of what God is doing. That is exactly why there's so much spiritual warfare. Because where California lands, that's where the church has the most opportunity to see God do something big. You want to know where the next miraculous revival is going to happen? I am totally off script. It is right here in California. It is absolutely right here in California. This is where I believe the next great awakening is going to start. And that is why you're here. Yeah. That is exactly why you're here. But Elimelech saw that the grass was greener on the other side, so he moved to Moab, a place outside of the borders of the promised land. He didn't know what was going to happen. Eventually, he passes away. His wife is there. They take their two sons. Because they're in Moab, uh, Naomi finds two women uh, for uh, her sons, and they get married. And unfortunately, in the land of Moab, both of the sons die. Now, again, we don't know the future. We don't know what the future looks like, and all we can do is trust God. Naomi was going with the flow. She finds herself in a pretty desperate situation, and both of her daughter-in-laws come to her, and they say, hey, we're with you. And Naomi convinces them to go back to their homeland to stay here while she comes back to Bethlehem, where she was from. And Orpah, they both, they both commit to this, but Orpah, um, you know, she's not a bad person. Maybe she's listening to her mother-in-law, and she says, okay, I'll do what you're saying for me to do. And she goes back to Moab. But there was one, there was a woman who said something different. And this is what Ruth said. Now, I, I don't have, I've told you a lot of the backstory, so we're not going to read it. And to be honest, I would love to actually preach through Ruth someday, so I'm going to kind of stay exegetically off of it a little bit. But I want to read what Ruth says to you because I, I need you to understand that, that if we're going to build a life-giving community, it starts with something that has already been mentioned, and that word is commitment. This is what commitment looks like. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Don't miss that. This is a woman who did not serve Yahweh, but through her association with Elimelech and his family has now come into relationship, at least through the family, with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the creator God, the God with no beginning and no end, the God over every single God and deity, demonic and non, on the face of this planet and beyond. The God that we serve, Jesus, and the, Jesus who would eventually become God in the flesh. This, that's the God that we're talking about. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Turn to your neighbor and say commitment. Wow. That is commitment. That is the kind of commitment that is a little hard to understand, to be honest with you. I mean, we are born in such a shallow, committed type of environment. We are trained to be committed to ourselves. We're trained to be committed to all sorts of things, but rarely to the right things. But here's the truth. If we're going to build a life-giving community, a church that, that breathes life into Orange County, we have to recognize that anything that is worth anything starts with commitment. And non-commitment is commitment to nothing. <laughs> All right? Uh, I, you know, if you've ever dated someone and they're just like, ah, I just can't commit to you, at some point you will have to come to the hard realization that they are committing just not to you, okay? That's free dating advice right there. <laughs> Non-commitment is commitment. Or you can be like, Kevin, be committed to yourself. And here's the truth. We can be committed to the wrong things, and that's not the kind of commitment God's calling us to. Orpah makes a commitment, but her commitment is not to Naomi or to Yahweh. It is to go home. We don't know a lot about Orpah or the path 
or what happened after that, but we know that she committed to go home. And Ruth takes a stand here. She makes a different kind of commitment to Naomi and to God. Don't miss that. She says, and to your God will be my God. Anything worth anything starts with commitment. Commitment to what God has created us to be committed to. You know, I got to the church. Uh, I, um, I received a gift from a longtime member of the church, and it was uh, a little pin that said, Together We Build. How many of you, just curious, have one of these little pins in, somewhere in your archives of stuff? <laughs> And I remember looking at, at that, and we, we ended up doing a whole series called Together We Build, and we're talking about community and the kind of church we wanted to build. But I've never forgotten the story behind that pin, and I've never forgotten the people behind that story. Because how many of you know when you commit to something, you're never committing alone, but you're almost always standing on the commitment of previous generations. Come on, turn your neighbor and say, yeah, I'm here because of a praying grandma or a praying parent or a pastor that wouldn't give up on me. I'm here. I'm here because someone committed to me. And as I heard the story, of course, as I pastored this church and heard the story, I learned that there was a building campaign, much like ours, right? And there's the numbers, and you walked in, and there's a now initiative, and we're asking you to commit, and we're trying to convince you, but here's the deal. We can't convince you to do anything that God hasn't called you to be committed to in your heart. <laughs> but you need to know that this church is not afraid of commitment. Once upon a time, the church was growing, and there were young families, and this guy named George Wood was pastoring this church, and there was all sorts of really awesome things happening, and they got to a place where they needed to make a decision to move onto a piece of property, but they needed to raise some funds to be able to do it, and so they started this campaign called Together We Build, and they eventually opened that property. I have the 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 the, uh, what is this called, the uh, order of service, is that what I'm supposed to call it, the dedication bulletin, it's not a bulletin, Bobby would, could tell me what it's supposed to be called, what, no, you know, like when you walk in, there's an order of service, there's a, a program, yes, <laughs> you know, like, what's he trying to say, someone help him, <laughs> of their dedication service, and it's just really, really cool, I love, I love things from the history of our church. Just, you know, so if you have anything, give it to me. I have a big box and, <clears throat> I mean, or loan it to me, whatever. People have made donations. It's not mine. I would, you know, try to keep it on behalf. Because I, I don't want us to forget our history. I don't, I don't want us to forget who, who we are or where we've come from. And one of the first things I ever read was, <clears throat> was then and now. And Pastor George wrote this, Pastor Wood wrote this. And I just, I, I, I gravitate still towards it. There's all sorts of things above it, but it was interesting to me that he actually put this in print in the dedication service. It says this, once the church has reached the size of 3,000 people, it intends to found other congregations throughout the South Orange County area. I've just been thinking about that for many, many years. I have nothing to do with it. There's nothing I can do in my strength to make it happen. But it is sort of an audacious and bold claim for a pastor to put something like that in print and not be willing to, in his own strength, be committed to that thing. How many of you know that God is a God without limitations? And he's also without timelines. It didn't happen in his era. I don't know if it'll happen in my era. I don't know if it'll ever happen. But what I do know is that whatever God's calling is on our church, it will require commitment. People who in their heart have committed to not only the cause and to God, to his kingdom, but to each other. That they would decide that this is a community that will give life to Orange County. And it starts with each of us. Together, we build. And together, they built. Do you know that the reason that we are in this building is because of the sacrifices of those people? And maybe you were one who gave to this. 
And we are in this building because you sacrificed and gave. Because the stipulation of the termination of the lease, the land, long-term land lease that we were on, was simply this, that we would be entitled to the fair market value of the buildings and improvements. And do you want to know why we were able to buy this building free and clear? It's because those people gave. The biggest donor of this church building is not anyone in this room. It's the church of 1984. <laughs> Who gave so that we could gain and it starts with commitment and this is a photo of the day that I was installed as pastor here that is dr. George Wood he's a hero of mine because he was a great biblical preacher <laughs> I mean lots of lots of incredible sermons but he was a man of commitment. And the bones of this church, the foundation of this church, is that we are not afraid to commit. It starts with Jesus and our commitment to Christ, and it extends to his kingdom and what God is doing. And we get our hands dirty. We get into the dirt of what God is doing. You might be thinking, well, I don't want to commit because I know it's going to cost me something. <laughs> and the truth is, we fear commitment because it, we know that it'll cost us, right? There's always something in the back of our head, right? As a single person, if someone asked you to go on a date, you're sort of thinking, well, what else do I have going on Friday night, you know? And, and, and you're trying to think, is there someone else that I'd like to go out with? Is there something else I'd like to spend my time doing, like washing my hair. Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> if someone needs to wash their hair and not go out with you, just know they're not committed to you. It's okay. Let them go find their fish. But you are not their lunker. We fear commitment because we know it will cost us. And the fear of missing out is something that we have to think about. This is what Jesus says in Luke 9, chapters, chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Eventually, he just says, the kingdom is not fit for people who look back. You've got to develop the kind of mentality that looks ahead. And Ruth gives up a lot. She gives up her homeland. She gives up her culture. She gives up her, her, her family. But she's focused on what she could gain with God in her life. And that couldn't have happened in Moab. Ruth has to make a commitment to God. And the fear of what it will cost her is overwhelmed by what she knows will happen because of her decision to commit. Great things happen when we commit. And we must be a church that is focused on what we are gaining. Why would we go all the way to this place not to pay the cost to get through those gates? I remember when I was 14 years old, my parents pulled us aside. They said, We've, we want to do something special this year. We want to go down to Disneyland. See, we were from Washington State where there's a lot of green trees and snow and rain and the Seahawks. <laughs> but we didn't have In-N-Out and we didn't have Disneyland. So my family saved up, they saved up, they saved up. And I'll remember, I'll, I never forget the church day. My, my dad preached the sermon, he left the pulpit, and we slipped out, right? Like, we were, we were always last to leave, but we were first to leave. They had made arrangements. We got on a plane, and we went south, and we got to Disneyland. And you know the place in between uh, California Adventure Disneyland, you've got that big pavilion, and we're standing there. And we get to the line, and my parents see the prices, and they say, sorry, kids, we saved up enough for the flights, but not to get in. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> How terrible would that be? All the way to Disneyland, and you see, you see all of the amazing things happening on the other side of those beautiful gates. And of course, we had so much fun. We had, made memories, and honestly, when I go to Disneyland today, there are places in Disneyland that are semi-sacred to me, because I sat with my dad in those places. He eventually passed away, and they're still sacred, because a lot of the things, they get changed or moved around, but, you know, there's a lot of the same structures. The bathrooms, actually. He spent a lot of times in the bathrooms. He must have had kidney problems, I don't know, but... Um, 
dad needs to go to the bathroom again. I know every bathroom at Disneyland, all right? Because of my dad. And they were committed to saving up because they knew that the cost was worth it to make those memories. And are we willing to pay the price of the memories that we will make? The marriages that will be restored, the babies that will be dedicated, the lives that are transformed, the brothers and sisters that we will water baptize into the kingdom, boldly standing with the truth of God's word that God has called me to be more than a conqueror. That alcoholism will not be my end, but that Jesus has saved me for a purpose. Sure, there'll be a cost. Just not financially, all sorts of things. You want to have kids, finances are the last thing you have to worry about. There's all sorts of costs associated. But here's the major problem with not committing. Getting to this place and then backing up. Getting to the, to the line that separates You and the Canaanites, oh, the giants are so big, we just can't do it. Okay, God says, go have fun in the desert for 40 years. But you've seen me provide. Yeah, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to to, to pay this cost. If the Holy Spirit is leading you, that there's nothing that you can't trust God for. I don't know if I should have another kid. Trust me, this message is so much more than just about money. (laughs) This commitment conversation, it's about everything. It's about the way that you live life. It's about not being afraid. It's about not just accepting the status quo, but it's about the boldness and the faith to believe that he has something more for you. Do you want to know why churches collapse and die? It's not because God's called them to death. It's because we struggle but I serve a God who meets me in my struggle. It's called grace. And he pours out grace and he pours out mercy and he's poured those things out in my life when I've said, man, the cost is too much, God. He comes alongside of me. He brings someone into my life. They give me encouragement. When I'm making that pledge and I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it, I'm plodding away. God does things that are outside of my field of understanding and he brings me to that place where I'm able to fulfill what he's called me to he does that for churches he does that for marriages he does that for professors and lawyers and teachers and doctors whatever it is that you're calling you've got to focus on what you're gaining and how God is going to provide you to the place where you're able to to fulfill that call on your life the cost there will be a cost because nothing worth anything costs nothing If it's going to be valuable in your life, it's going to be precious, a grandson or a granddaughter, you better believe there will be costs. And then you got to just take those little snapshots, those moments where that baby is just a little head there. There are those moments where God just opens the curtains, doesn't he? And it's like you can see through and you see heaven. The major problem with thinking that there's going to be something that we miss out on or something that we need more is that the cost will be far greater than we will ever know. There's more cost in not committing You don't know, none of us knows the future. (laughs) Elimelech didn't know the future when he moved to Moab. Ruth didn't know the future when she moved back. And yet we know that it's that commitment to the right things, to God, to Christ, to the kingdom that he's building and not allowing fear to hold us back from sacrificing what is precious for what is even more precious that cultivates the kind of community that at our deepest longing we crave. This is why church hurt is the hardest hurt. It's the most painful hurt. 
because we get so idealistic about what the church should be, and you should be idealistic. Because the church today, no church lives up to the standard of God. It's so painfully short. And yet, it's still the bride of Christ. I know who she is, and that's why I serve. Story of an elderly man who was at a doctor's appointment at 8 a.m. Said, let's, let's get a move on this. I'm fine. I want to make my 9 o'clock appointment. The doctor said, well, what is it that is causing you to be in such a rush? He said, well, my wife is, a, is at a nursing home, and I, I go there every morning, and I have breakfast with her at 9 a.m. She has Alzheimer's. And the doctor said, does she, does she recognize you? He said, no. He said, well, why are you in such a rush to get to this woman who doesn't recognize you? And he says, Doc, she may not recognize me, but I recognize her. And I made a commitment, and I'm going to follow through on that commitment. You see, there's something that happens in us that we get, that we gain, that happens in our heart when we follow through on the commitments that God has placed on our hearts. It cultivates the kind of commitment, the kind of community that we all crave. Anything that you've sacrificed for, that you've committed to, whether it's your marriage or your kids or your career, you never ask the question, what did it cost? <laughs> when you think back on the things that matter most in life, it's a different question. It's more of a thankfulness. It's, it's what did we gain? Because the church may not be who the church needs to be. But when I think of my willingness to commit to this imperfect body of believers, I think about all of the different ways my life has been blessed. Ruth and Naomi gain so much more than just redemption. I want to go to a, the Bible Project slide. I actually thought about playing the seven-minute intro to, uh, to, to, to this, and I, I did put it in the notes just so that you know. It's there if you want to go watch the seven-minute version of the Bible Project. Bible Project is an incredible biblical literacy tool that I recommend to anyone and everyone. If you want to know what a book of the Bible is about in five to seven minutes, you'll know. But this is the story of where that comment comes into play, right here, where... Out of Bethlehem, they moved to Moab, and through the death of Elimelech and his two sons, Ruth says to Naomi, who's just heartbroken over the whole thing, and she says, God hasn't been with me. I'm just bitter. And she says, I'm going to go with you. And then the rest of the book is about how her honest efforts to meet Boaz and God's sovereign hand sort of converge to create this beautiful, redemptive story, not just for Ruth, but for Naomi. And at the end of the book, it's actually Naomi who has been redeemed. All of the painful process and journey of where they had been culminated in a, a godly man committing to Ruth. And Ruth and Boaz getting together, and having a baby. And everything changes for Naomi at that point. She has her kinsman redeemer, the, the person that was designed by God to make sure that there was a legacy after this family's life. Because when you're in Moab and all of your husband and both your sons die, it's just, that's it. There's no more story. And yet with God, there's always more to the story. And through that baby, Obed, came another baby named Jesse who had eight sons. You know where I'm going. The eighth son named David. As we inch up to Christmas this year, have you ever thought about the lineage 
of Jesus. And all of the different stories of the radical commitments that people made and how God weaved them into this larger, bigger picture. You see, David was the great-grandson of Ruth, the Moabitess, and Jesus was in the line of David. You see, the cost of not committing, we won't actually ever know. We don't know what happened to Orpah, <laughs> but we do know what happened with Ruth. We do know that God weaved this story together and brought about the kind of community that resulted in David being born and the kind of culture that created a king out of that time that would lead God's people with the heart of God. And it was through the line of David that Jesus would come. You see, God wants us to be the kind of people that gain through our commitment to give up. That if we would commit to what God is doing here, that he will be faithful to work out all of the details that, hey, in all honesty, we have no idea how it's all going to play out. I mean, the truth is, we'll have a $2.3 million lump sum payment in five years due. We did what we needed to do to survive. I don't know how we're going to pay that. But I know that as all of us come together, as God grows the church, as we get closer to that moment where that payment is due, I don't know where the rates are going to be. We might refinance at 29%. Who knows? You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to just pay that off before then. But None of you have to commit to paying that. But we do have to commit to believing God and obeying God, and trusting God, and stepping out in faith, and believing that God is going to work this out according to his will. We have no idea what's going to happen, and we don't need to. We just need to commit. That's it. I want you to stand up. We're going to end our service today a little differently. I want you to line the room. I want you to go ahead and and get out of your seat and align the room. Life-giving communities are built on commitment, but sometimes we forget where that commitment comes from, don't we? There's a photo that I could not find. If someone has it or knows where it is, I would love to see it. But it's a photo of Newport Mesa Christian Center, not the organization, but God's people. I want you guys to try to spread out and come all the way up so that you guys can hold hands. And it's this giant circle, and it, it's actually on the property of where our old building was. Is there anyone who knows what I'm talking about? I'm just curious. You've seen this photo? It's such an iconic photo. I'd love to get a digital copy of it. But it's a beautiful image of what the church is. You see, sometimes we think the church is an organization, and it is a little bit, right? There has to be more income than outcome and all of the other things that keep us afloat. But the church at the end of the day is God's people. Every month we do this thing called the mixer, and we spend the first half of the meeting actually talking about, how did you hear about the church? Who was it that, that played a spiritual influence on your life? And then at the end of that, I just say something very simple. I say, all of that to say is, Mesa Church is you. It's the collective story. It's the collective narrative of God's people. Individuals who have decided that this is a church family that God's calling me to. That we are going to commit, not just to God, but to his kingdom. To life beyond this building. And to missions and all the other beautiful things that we get to be a part of and we get to commit to each other every morning I, I, I hear the reports of our 6 a.m. prayer meeting <laughs> that happens over zoom that prays for the prayer requests of God's people and praise the Lord there are more prayer answers than there are requests at least that's what Glenn told me last month 
and God's a part of this. And this is the church. I want you to grab the person next to you and just hold their hand. Commitment doesn't start at an organizational level. It starts at an individual level. We must choose to decide to be committed to what it is that we believe that God is doing through our church. And it's not just Mesa. Trust me. If you don't feel a sense of connection to this church, find a church that you can be committed to. Because the church in the United States needs your commitment. The time of us wandering around and just being loosely affiliated, that's not going to work in the last days. It will not work in California. It's not going to work for your friends or neighbors. What they are looking for is something deeper. Not just a brand or a bumper sticker, and we got those, that you can put on your forehead. But something that they can be a part of that's meaningful, that's relational, that's authentic, that's real. Something that Ruth had. Someone who never should have been involved. But God in his providence and sovereignty said, I'm going to let you carry a piece of this story that the world will always know about. I want you to squeeze the hand of the person to your right and to the left. They are that person. You are that person. Someone God has chosen to work through in this season. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we think about what it is that you've called us to be committed to, Lord, you'll never ask us to be committed beyond our being, beyond our presence. And Lord, showing up for so many of us will be enough in the hard season to be committed, to be there for others. But Lord, you're also calling us to step into serving roles, to, to, to begin to give. Maybe we've never given, and you're calling us to give financially to what you are doing in this church. Lord, maybe we've given for a long time, and you're calling us to give at a level that goes beyond what we've given, to, to give beyond a tithe. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today so that we can have the same kind of commitment that Ruth had. Not because she knew what was going to happen, but because she knew who holds the future. And Lord, her story is a story of day-by-day discovery of what it was and what it was, was going to happen, how you would use her in the story of Jesus. And Lord, all of us, every church in Orange County and, and across the state of California, across the U.S., across the globe, is a small part of this bigger story of Jesus being introduced to the world. And Jesus, we want to be a part of the proclamation of your word. Yes, God. We want to be a part of the gospel being the good news of Jesus and his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy. But more than all of that, Lord, we want to be a part of the family, the body of Christ that you will use to disciple and to help people growing in their relationship with Jesus. And that's what we're giving our lives to. That's what we're serving for. That's what we're giving towards. We're present because we know our presence makes a difference. And Lord, I pray that you would make this congregation a family in the days and years to come because of the blood of Jesus Christ, which was sacrificed for us. In Jesus' name.